Good morning, Little Masters, and welcome back to today's Tolkien Times. I'm the Man of the West, also from the Prancing Pony podcast. Let's keep week 15 going with today's Tolkien Tuesday. Now, before we do, just a quick uh, reminder, I am once again uh, still dealing with that broken collarbone and the surgery and all of that, so you're going to see that I look the same for this entire week's worth of episodes as I record all at the same time. Probably going to do the same thing for week 16, and then we'll get back to, uh, to what it used to look like once we start Series 3. Now, speaking of Series 2, this has been a fun run of episodes. We've been working our way through the letters as we've learned more about the publication of The Lord of the Rings. Last week, we spent most of our time looking at that very early BBC adaptation. I sure wish I could hear that, despite Tolkien's clear dislike for it. I loved Brian Sibley's later BBC adaptation, though, and I'm pretty sure this initial one just couldn't have matched up. This week, though, I want to look at some letters that Tolkien wrote in response to his very earliest fan letters, including one personal favorite of mine. I'm going to start by going back in time to 1948. The Hobbit had been out for 11 years by that point, and Tolkien had received a letter from a young boy by the name of Hugh Brogan, who was only 12 at that time. He'd asked for more information about the world described in The Hobbit, and Tolkien's response is in the volume as letter number 114. He tells this 12-year-old boy that he won't find any information about that older world in ordinary works of reference, since I possess all the documents, and publishers won't publish them. What you really require is the Silmarillion, which is virtually a history of the Eldadie, or elves by a not very accurate translation, from their rise to the last alliance and the first temporary overthrow of Sauron, the necromancer. That would bring you nearly down to the period of The Hobbit. I absolutely love that. Tolkien recommending the Silmarillion to a 12-year-old when it hasn't been published. <laughs> well, the thing is, Hugh seems to have made a habit of writing to Tolkien, because the professor wrote back on many occasions. By 1954, Brogan was 18. Tolkien wrote back again, answering many questions, including one on goblins versus orcs, one on the nature of Middle-earth itself, specifically that the new situation, established at the beginning of the Third Age, leads on eventually and inevitably to ordinary history. And here, we see the process culminating. Now, he also mentioned the whole, I haven't seen a dime yet thing again. He says, I know 21 shillings is a frightful price, but don't forget that I have to sell an awful lot before the ghastly expenses are paid off. The fact that I get not a halfpenny until that is done does not matter so much as this. If enough are sold, I may be able to publish more. So add to your great kindness in inducing such as you can to beg, borrow, or steal a guinea rather than a copy. While we may come back to Brogan's letters for a bit more on Tolkien's choice of language sometime, in fact, I guarantee you we will, we're going to leave him for now, but not before telling you that this young man corresponding with Tolkien would become an accomplished historian, author, and biographer himself. Now, another early fan letter was a bit more critical. Peter Hastings was the manager of a Catholic bookstore in Oxford, and while he wrote to Tolkien expressing his appreciation for The Lord of the Rings, he wondered if Tolkien had overstepped the mark in metaphysical matters. The questions raised and the answers given would take several Tolkien Tuesdays just on their own, and maybe someday we'll do that, but I want to read one paragraph from Tolkien's response, because it speaks so clearly to a question I'm always asked. Who is Tom Bobadil really? Tolkien explains, I don't think Tom needs philosophizing about, and is not improved by it, but many have found him an odd or indeed discordant ingredient. In historical fact, I put him in because I had already invented him independently. He first appeared in the Oxford Magazine, and wanted an adventure on the way. But I kept him in, and as he was, because he represents certain things otherwise left out. I do not mean him to be an allegory or I should not have given him so particular, individual, and ridiculous a name. But allegory is the only mode of exhibiting certain functions. He is, then, an allegory, or an exemplar, a particular embodying of pure, real, natural science, the spirit that desires knowledge of other things, their history and nature, because they are other and wholly independent of the inquiring mind, a spirit co-evolved with the rational mind and entirely unconcerned with doing anything with the knowledge. Now, Tolkien's humility, and at least still at this point, appreciation for readers' love for the works, is on display in letter number 159 to Dora Marshall. He starts there by acknowledging that it remains an unfailing delight to me to find my own belief justified that the fairy story is really an adult genre and one for which a starving audience exists. I said so, more or less, in my essay on the fairy story in the collection dedicated to the memory of Charles Williams. 
By the way, that is, of course, a reference to On Fairy Stories. It's a central work to understanding Tolkien's writings, and it just so happens I'm going through that right now on the Patreon Premium Weekly Bonus Episodes. Now, Tolkien goes on to talk about the efforts and the reward of getting his book done. He says to her, The labor. I have typed myself nearly all of it twice, and parts more often, not to mention the written stages. But I am amply rewarded and encouraged to find that the labor was not wasted. One such letter as yours is sufficient and furnishes more than any author ought to ask. But I want to end by looking at letter number 184 to a Mr. Sam Gamgee of Brixton Road, London. In March of 1956, Gamgee wrote to Tolkien saying, in part, I was rather interested at how you arrived at the name of one of the characters named Sam Gamgee, because that happens to be my name. Then, referring to the BBC adaptation we talked about last week, he adds, I haven't heard the story myself, not having a wireless, but I know some who have. I know it's fiction, but it is rather a coincidence, as the name is very uncommon, but well-known in the medical profession. Tolkien's reply is charming, fun, and informative. He tells the real Sam Gamgee about his reason for using the name. I lived near Birmingham as a child, and we used Gamgee as a word for cotton wool. So in my story, the families of Cotton and Gamgee are connected. I did not know as a child, though I know now, that Gamgee was shortened from Gamgee tissue, and that it was named after its inventor, a surgeon, I think. It was probably, I think, his son who died this year on 1st of March, aged 88, after being for many years professor of surgery at Birmingham University. Evidently, Sam or something like it is associated with the family, though I never knew this until a few days ago when I saw Professor Gamgee's obituary notice and saw that he was son of Samson Gamgee and looked in a dictionary and found that the inventor was S. Gamgee. Tolkien goes on to say that if Mr. Gamgee wanted to learn more, he could find the Lord of the Rings in most public libraries. It is, alas, very expensive to buy, three pounds, three shillings, but if you or any of your family try it and find it interesting enough, I can only say that I shall be happy and proud to send you a signed copy of all three volumes as a tribute from the author to the distinguished family of Gamgee. Sam replied shortly after that with more information about his family name and unsurprisingly was thrilled at Tolkien's offer. Tolkien sent him those signed copies. Gamgee wrote again to acknowledge their arrival. I can assure you that I have every intention of reading them. Actually, Mr. Gamgee, might I suggest you buy a second set and put that sign set in a very, very safe place? <laughs> oh, what a lovely thing that would have to, to be to have on your shelf, huh? Uh, you know, my, my grandfather received this personally signed set of The Lord of the Rings, first edition from Professor Tolkien. Well, folks, that does wrap it up for this week's Tolkien Tuesday. Now, next week, the last of this series of the TTT, we're going to take a look at the first translations of The Lord of the Rings and get some of Tolkien's thoughts. In the meantime, please visit patreon.com slash Tolkien Times to learn how you can support the show, get an ad-free feed, monthly hangout, and a bonus weekly episode and a lot more. Finally, join me again tomorrow on today's Tolkien Times for Word Nerd Wednesday. If you're watching this on YouTube, please be sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Please follow or subscribe in your podcast apps and follow at Tolkien Times on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Finally, as Faramir says, go with the goodwill of all good men. <laughs>